And what he wrote on the board was, swift is the booty, speedy is the prey. It was another word to ahas, is that they will come in terror. They are coming in terror. And, and you need to listen to what the Lord will direct you if you want to survive. Third message comes. The third message comes. And it's this. It's that because northern Israel and Aram have chosen to fight Assyria, rather than choose the negotiating tactics that Ahaz was currently going through, they would be destroyed. And they would be destroyed because the Lord would bring Assyria. It's not Assyria just doing their own thing. It says the Lord would bring Assyria. And Assyria would come through and he would even get into Judah up to its neck. And yet they would survive a little longer. So Isaiah's bringing these prophecies. Even though Judah is saying, the Lord won't let that happen to us. And you see in there, it says, Emmanuel, God is with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. And yet Isaiah is having to say, no, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. And that's where we step into. So three words have been given to, to, uh, to Ahaz, and here's the fourth. So we step into this. It says, For the, thus the Lord spoke to me, Isaiah, with mighty power, and instructed me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, You're not to say, It's a conspiracy in regard to all that this people call a conspiracy, and you're not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. All right. So when Isaiah is told, you're not to walk in the way of this people, to walk in the way is a me metaphorical way of saying you're not to have their values, you're not to have their worldview, okay? And when he says this people, it's not his people, right? The Lord is saying this people, they're not my people. They're people that are no longer following the direction of the Lord. And he goes on to say, you're not to say with them, it's a conspiracy. Now why would they be saying it's a conspiracy? So the reality is, is they knew the presence of this growing superpower. They knew that, and they wanted to attack it before they attacked them. And they wanted Judah to join them in that. So when they say it's a conspiracy... They wanted Judah to join their confederacy in order to attack Assyria. They wanted them to do that. And the Lord says, you're, you're, not, to, you're not to agree with them that it's a conspiracy. Um, he goes on to say, you're not to fear what they fear. That's, again, walking in the way. Okay? So think about this just practically for us, and we'll talk about this a little, a little bit more. Someone says, they're the enemy. Do we join them when someone else says to us, they're the enemy? That's what Judah was being told. You should be afraid of these people. That's what Judah was being told. That's what we might be told. But the Lord is saying through Isaiah, you're not to fear what they fear. Then he goes on to say you're not to be in dread of it. And that, what that means, that word underneath there, it means you're not to cause to tremble. Has anyone ever told you something so frightening that you actually started to shake? You're not to panic. You're not to panic. So in summary, so what Isaiah is saying is the followers of the Lord, the followers of the Lord are not to share others' values or join in their worldly assessment of military threats. And they're not to be in fear of those things or they're not to panic in those things. All right. Now that's an interesting word. It's an interesting word for us, okay? Now, he goes on to say in verse 13, It's the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy. He shall be your fear. He shall be your dread. Then he shall become a sanctuary. But to both houses of Israel, a stone to strike, a rock to stumble over, and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. All right, so why? Why does he say, why, why did Isaiah not report on behalf of the Lord? It's the Lord whom you shall fear. He didn't say that first. He said that second. What he said first, it's the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy. Now why the Lord of hosts? What is a host? Uh, that's an old word. I mean, it's just, uh, brought out of here. Host was a word that they used, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't know, two centuries ago to mean armies. So, and it, what it means there underneath is the Lord of the armies. There's a word underneath there that means both soldier and and servant. And what the Lord is reminding them here is that 
when he took them out of Egypt in Exodus 14, he said, these people with me are the servants of the Lord. They are the armies of the Lord. You serve me. And so he is the Lord of hosts, and he's reminding them of that, and he's saying, for you, for you that will follow me, you should regard me as holy. Now why holy? What does holiness have to do with the fact that I've got someone that's killing and marauding on my border? What does that have to do with that? Well, here's the issue. Is the Lord wants our focus, our direction, to be from Him, not from a terrorist. Right? Who are you going to react to? Someone throws a punch in your face. You, auto you automatically react? Someone flies a plane into one of your buildings. Do you automatically react? Who's the Lord when you automatically react? I am. I say how I'm going to take you down. And that's what the Lord wants to stop. You're to regard the Lord as holy. Because it's the Lord that cares for us. Right? It's, it's, it's the Lord that, that loves us. It's the Lord who fights our battles. Right? And I can go after time and time again through scriptures where Israel was woefully inadequate to the thousands of troops around them. And the Lord fought their battle for them. And so he wants us to be able to focus and to turn to him. Because he knows that even apart from anything that we do, anything that we do, the Lord will be fighting our battle. Sometimes we won't have to do anything. And I can give you examples of, of Gideon. I can give you examples of Hezekiah, uh, Moses, Pharaoh's army gets crushed behind them as, as they're moving out. The Lord fights our battles. And then here's the other reality, is that when we don't turn to the Lord, we can so ignorantly, suddenly, become enemies of God. If I say, I'm going to take them down, and my motivation is not a holy motivation, we have suddenly become an enemy of God. And God will take us down. God will take us down. That's what he says he's going to do to the northern kingdom and to Aram. He's going to take them down. We can do that unless we turn and we regard the Lord as holy. He says, he shall be your fear, right? It's the Lord is the one that we should be in dread of. We should panic, panic when we think about the Lord. Panic right now. Panic when you think of the Lord. <gasps> what would Jesus say? Don't fear him who can, you know, take your body. Fear him, right? Who's got control of your soul. So much greater. We need to panic if we don't do what the Lord wants. He will be our dread. He will be our dread. But to both houses of Israel, he'll be that stumbling stone. He says, he says that, that he, he will be a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over. You know, and what that means is because they are the enemies of God, Israel and Aram will be taking this stone, it's a striking stone, think of a hammer, and going, get out of my way, God. I want to get to them, God. You are in my way. Who's going to win that fight? The Lord's going to win that fight. He's going to be a stumbling stone. They're going to trip as they try to walk on the road to accomplish what they want. Because he will not be thwarted. He will accomplish judgment when judgment is necessary. Because he's a father that disciplines in love. He wants to restore people. And he won't let us continue to walk in places where we continue to screw up. To hurt ourselves to hurt other people. We need to turn to the Lord, regard Him as holy when there's a threat, when there's a threat going on. The upshot is, is that anyone that relies on worldly wisdom, like the northern kingdom and like Aram, they end up fearing and reacting and suffering because of that. Because they do not stop to regard the Lord as holy. So what does that mean for us? How do, we, how do we put this to work in our life? Well, look, here's, here's the reality, is that it is the Lord that fights our battles. 
He has always been the one that's fought our battles. And, you know, I was trying to think about this. What, what does this have to do with us? I mean, we're Christians in the United States. We're talking about Israel. And it's easy to think that Israel at this point was a theocracy, but they were not. They were not. See, the, the theocracy where God leads the country, that ended as soon as Israel wanted a king. And as soon as they got a king, there was a, a separate political leader from the religious leader of the people. Does that sound like the United States? Yeah, yeah. We have a, a political leader that we elect, but then we have the church. And just like Isaiah is calling to the people who will be faithful to follow Yahweh, the Lord's calling to us in the same way, in the same way. And so what do we do? Right, what do we do? We seek, regard the Lord as holy. What does that look like? When you've got, when you've got terrorists that are, that are sending messages, what does that look like? You regard the Lord as holy. You seek the Lord. You come together in prayer. You look for Him to fight your battles. We also protect each other. It's not like we let each other get pummeled because always part of caring each other is always protecting each other. We don't let someone take someone out just because, you know, that would be irresponsible. But in doing that, we're seeking the Lord's guidance. We have to realize that those people that call us their enemies, the Lord loves them. Jesus calls us to love them. So what did the National Council of Churches do? Were there churches? Have we been meeting together for 10 years seeking the Lord as a response to this? Let's pray.